Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt and this is Cutting to the Matrix on the 21st of January 2009. For the newcomers, I always suggest you look into cuttingthroughthematrix.com and on that website you'll find hundreds of hours of talks I've given over the years where I try to piece together a system, a system that's run the past and a system that's running the present and a system that knows exactly where it's taking us all. It's a very old plan. It's a very powerful institution that runs the world. It's been behind most of the wars that we've gone through. Because out of conflict, you get treaties and signed, and you get people to their knees. You bring them to their knees through war and conflict until they'll agree for peace. Everyone wants peace. But of course those at the top have a different agenda and they're run by very, very rich people at the top. They're all pretty well involved. I try to piece it together for people by using history or will warn people that those who control the past control the future and so on. Most people today have been told that the past is irrelevant. That's deliberate so they don't know what's really happening to today. You'll react to what you're given to react about today without knowing what the whys and wherefores or what's really behind it. Also look into Alan Watt Sentinel, sentinel.eu where you can download transcripts of these talks and they're written in the various languages of Europe. For those that want to keep me going, you can donate to my show and you'll find out how to do it on cuttingthroughmatrix.com. You can also buy the items I have for sale, and that keeps me going. I don't ask for money from any of the shows I'm on. The advertising that you hear pays the station, it pays the people who work, the engineers and so on, to keep going. That's how everything works in the system at the present time, although gradually we'll see the whole system worldwide changing as we go into a new economic system of service to a world government. I have watched some of the videos, listened to some of the audios of Mr. Rockefeller, who travels around the world, talking about what's wrong with it, in his opinion. And it isn't just his opinion. You see, the big society that he belongs to, in fact, his family was set up by this society to be very, very rich and powerful. They fund many different organizations, including educational systems across a good part of the world to make sure they're all teaching the same things in the correct way to shape the minds of millions of people who go through their entire lives never knowing that everything that they know and think about and thought about was guided by very manipulative people who knew the sciences of a form of mind control. What you're taught is how it will actually bring about reactions from you. Young people who are recruited into societies in elite universities in the past worked towards a global agenda from Oxford, and they really believed in it, many of them. They really believed they could bring civilization, as they called it, to the world based on a British system. Of course, those at the top had other ideas. That's how the whole system is run. Idealism is a fantastic weapon. Idealism sets missionaries across the whole planet. And the ones who are running the world are a form of missionary with a plan. Back in a moment after the following messages. the matrix. The past few talks I've given have been on a variety of subjects, but they're all interconnected. In fact, they're really all one, because I've gone into the connections of the CIA, MI6, that came out of the OSS, and how the OSS really came out of what was called the Royal Institute for International Affairs, and the 
Council on Foreign Relations. In fact, the OSS headquarters was Chatham House in England, which was the headquarters of the RIIA. It was well known in the 1800s that Britain had a very good secret service, which it drew upon its members from the, the Ivy League schools becoming granite stone over there, as opposed to the red brick universities of the ordinary people. And in the late 1800s, there was a vision to use the British system, which is supposed to be the most advanced according to those who led Britain, who owned Britain to an extent, and they wanted to push that across the world. They also wanted to take over the world's resources. And there was a lecturer at Oxford University who got novices in, young idealists, and Cecil Rhodes was one of them. Cecil Rhodes began what was called the Cecil Rhodes Foundation, which set up round table societies to try and get different segments of society together and to debate certain problems and find ways to implement them, the, the solutions throughout society. Eventually this blossomed into, or at least merged with another institution called the Alfred Lord Alfred Milner Group. And the two of them together actually caused the Boer War. They had a group to raid South Africa, and they had reporters on the spot that would lie and say that the Boers had attacked British settlers. And, of course, Britain is, we just sat and waited, and they had no option but to come in with the troops and take over South Africa. That's how they played the game. And Professor Carroll Quigley talks about this kind of stuff in Tragedy and Hope and the Anglo-American establishment. He was the historian for the Council on Foreign Relations. It's interesting, too, that I think it was Macmillan bought over the plates which they used for making the book, for printing, and they were apparently destroyed. He'd let too much out of the bag, I suppose. Because, as he says in his own book, Tragedy and Hope, he said, he said it is a secret or a semi-secret society. It likes to keep its head down. But he does admit in the book, too, it's been behind most of the major events that happened worldwide in the 20th century. The society, as I say, created a front organization. I'm going to read some more of this particular book because if you can't understand the past, as Mr. Rockefeller says, you'll never catch on. You'll never catch on to what's happening today. These are the, these are the groups that created the divisions across the Middle East. They drew the lines in the sand and said, you're now this country and you're the other country. They take, they take accountability for that. They accept that. They, take, they accept the fact that they drew the boundary for Ireland. How many of the Irish know that? But to go into some of the history of it, as I say, it's totally interwoven with what you think of as MI6 and the CIA. In fact, many of the members, if not most, are, are members of both. There has been no democracy because the elite decided long ago they would allow the public to have democracy. The, the book, The Cultural Cold War, is called in, in the U.S. edition, it's called a different name in Britain for those in Britain who want to get a hold of it. It's called Who Paid the Piper? CIA and the Cultural Cold War by Francis Stoner Saunders. The American edition is called The Cultural Cold War, The CIA and the World of Arts and Letters. It's astonishing that we do have facts out there and yet people don't put it all together. If people do try to put it together, they put it with a slant to the right wing against the left and the left against the right. And yet, Professor Carl Quigley said himself, he says, it does exist and has existed for a generation an international Anglophile network which operates to some extent in the way the radical right believes the communists act. In fact, this network, which we may identify as a round table groups, has no aversion to cooperating with the communists or any other groups and frequently does so. I know of the operations of this network because I've studied it for 20 years. 20 years he studied it. 
and was permitted for two years in the early 60s, 1960s, to examine its papers and secret records. In the same book, Tragedy and Hope, he goes through the system and the Anglo-American establishment, his other book. He goes through this whole organization and how it is a parallel government. To be honest with you, it's really the real government because every president and prime minister takes their, takes their orders from it. They advise all the top governments of the Western world. And they have the money to back it up because the bankers are all in on it, as this book will tell you. It says here, going back into the last century again, because you must do it to understand what even happened in the 20th century. It says, by 1915, round table groups existed in seven countries. Now, they're still on the go. This is not old stuff. They're still working today, including England, South Africa, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, and a rather loosely organized group in the United States, which was comprised of George Lewis Beer, Walter Lippmann, Frank Adolet, Whitney Shepherson, Thomas W. Lamont, Jerome Dick D. Green, very interesting guy, Edwin D. Canham of the Christian Science Monitor, and others. The attitudes of the various groups were coordinated by frequent visits and discussions by a well-informed and totally anonymous quarterly magazine, The Round Table. Today, you can get Foreign Affairs magazine. That will tell you what's coming up in the world. It says here, the leaders of this group were Milner, that's Lord Alfred Milner, until his death in 20, 1925, followed by Curtis, a very important person. He was like a Kissinger in his time all over the planet. Robert H. Lord Brandt, or Brand, brother-in-law of, uh, of Lady Astor. The Astors, by the way, were part of this group. And at the same time, they were funding and starting up the Fabian Society for what people think was the socialist movement. These were all lords and bankers and so on. Until his death in 1963, and now Adam D. Maris, son of Sir William and Brandt's successor as managing director of Lazard Brothers Bank, that through have helped fund them as well, Lazard Brothers. The original intention had been to have collegial leadership, but Milner was too secretive and headstrong to share the role. He did so only in the period 1913 to 1919, when he had regular meetings with some of his closer friends to coordinate activities as a pressure group in the struggle with Wilhelmine at Germany. They also, what they used to do too, was train people right out in, from university. They'd pick them and choose the ones with more, with more, most fervor that they could actually use as basically disciples, devotees. They called them the kindergarten. They still do it at university today. And as you well know, the CIA and MI6 recruit right out of there too. It's one and the same thing. Money from the widely ramified activities of this organization originally came from the associates and followers of Cecil Rhodes, chiefly from the Rhodes Trust itself, and from wealthy associates such as the Bate brothers from Sir Abe Bailey, and after 1915 from the Astor family. Since 1925, there have been substantial contributions from wealthy individuals, you better, better believe it, and from foundations and firms associated with international banking fraternity especially the Carnegie United Kingdom Trust and other organizations associated with Chai P. Morgan, the Rockefeller and Whitney families and the associates of Lazard Brothers and of Morgan, Grenfell and Company. You should look into the Rees Commission and I'll put a link up tonight where Norman Dodd talks about it when he was told face to face by some of these bankers in fact, I think it was a Morgan Bank he was talking to. And they told him that the bankers had changed their role. Then it had become a form of institution because in society there were too many conflicting interests to be left up to sort of formulate themselves. If the banks would be a form of social control. Very interesting thing to say because that's almost exactly what the Club of Rome said when they chose the collectivist idea, they said there were too many conflicting parties in the world for peace. And so they would choose collectivism. That's what's being pushed on us now. And that's what this president, uh, president of the United States has been put in for. He won't do it. He's just an actor, like they all are. 
but he'll, he'll, ram, he'll sign all the different uh, treaties and so on that the U.S. has so far refused to sign. That's his job, to bring all of this in. It says, the chief backbone of this organization grew up along the already existing financial cooperation running from the Morgan Bank in New York to a group of international financiers in London led by Lazard Brothers. Milner himself in 1901 had refused a fabulous offer worth up to $100,000 a year, that was a lot of money then, to become one of the three partners of the Morgan Bank in London in succession to the younger J.P. Morgan who moved from London to join his father in New York. Eventually the vacancy went to E.C. Grenfell so the London affiliate of Morgan became known as Morgan, Grenfell and Company. Instead, Miller became director of a number of public banks, a number of public banks, chiefly the London Joint Stock Bank, corporate uh, precursor of the Midland Bank, it transformed into the Midland Bank, became one of the greatest political and financial powers in England, with his disciples strategically placed throughout England in significant places such as the editorship of The Times, the observer and managing director of Lazard Brothers. Quite the character, and it's still the same today. Back with more after this break. Hi folks, I am Alan Watt. We're cutting through the matrix and it's safe to understand the present and where we're going very rapidly into this new future. If they go into the past, understand that it truly is a massive organization worldwide that runs pretty well every side of every conflict because conflict is a way to get to your goal. At the end of conflicts you have agreements, you have takeovers, you should call them empire building and we bring into the world empire. There's only a few countries to be flattened before it's complete and those ones who get flattened are the ones they decided a long time ago couldn't fit in to this new economic, civilized society, as they put it themselves. I was reading about Milner, a very important person that helped set up part of this group, a big part of this group. And it says here, he became the editor of the Times and of the Observer, managing director of Lazard Brothers at Banking International, various administrative posts, and even cabinet positions as politicians. They're politicians in every country. Ramifications were established in politics, high finance, Oxford and London universities, periodicals, that's magazines, the civil service, that's bureaucracy, and tax-exempt foundations. That was their method of transferring money, just as it was from the book, as I say, the Cultural Cold War, also called Who Paid the Piper?, and they still use the foundations today. There are thousands of them. And many of them are fronts and dummies that simply transfer money from one to the other. And they also are in the field of depopulating the planet, if you look to where the money is all going. At the end of World War I, 1914, it became clear that the organization of the system had to be greatly extended. Now, they had a plan to unite Europe. They had a plan to unite the Americas. In fact, in 2005, on the Canadian television the CFR came out as the CFR with Mr. Manley, or Manning on it. It was Manley. And uh, he'd been high up in politics in the Canadian federal government, and he spoke about having drafted up the agreements that the presidents and prime ministers were signing for the further integration of the Americas. So they drafted up all of that. And I bet you anything, too, because many of the members mentioned in this book were working on the United Europe. They drafted up all of that as well. But they also had a, a far-ranging plan, a hundred years plan for the Far East, using Australia and New Zealand as their bases to bring all of that together. They were working in China and Japan. Remember what Karl Marx said? There'd be three major trading blocks under a world government. He said that in the 1800s as well. It says here, once again, the task was entrusted to Lionel Curtis to establish in England and each dominion, that's each part of the Commonwealth countries, a front, or, a front organization. Remember what Cecil Rhodes said? They based their organization on the Jesuits. The Jesuits were famous for setting up front organizations, having people fight each other, 
well, they remain unscathed at the back, out of sight. A front organization in each country was to be set up to the existing local round table group. This front organization called the Royal Institute of International Affairs, it's a front organization, had as its nucleus in each area the existing submerged round table group. In New York, it was known as the Council on Foreign Relations. It was a front for J.P. Morgan and Company in association with the very small American round table group. It's much bigger now, of course. The American organizers, organizers were dominated by the large number of Morgan experts, including Lamont and Beer, who had gone to the Paris Peace Conference and they became close friends with a similar group of English experts, which had been recruited by the Milner Group. In fact, the original plans for the Royal Institute of International Affairs and the Council on Foreign Relations were drawn up at Paris. The Council of the Royal Institute of International Affairs which in Curtis's energy came to be housed in Chatham House across St. James Square from the Astors, from the Astor family, who was helping fund it too. And was soon known by the name of this headquarters. And the board of the Council on Foreign Relations have carried ever since the marks of their origin until 1960 the Council at Chatham House was dominated by the dwindling group of Milner's associates while the paid staff members were largely the, agent of, the agents of Lionel Curtis the round table for years until 1961 was edited from the back door of Chatham House, Browns and Ormond Yard, and its telephone came through the Chatham House switchboard. The New York branch was dominated by the associates of the Morgan Bank. Then he goes into all the different characters involved in running that system from and out of the Morgan Bank over many, many years. Names all the different big family names, which are very, very well known. The academic figures have been those linked to Morgan, such as James T. Shortwell, Seymour, Joseph P. Chamberlain, Philip Jessup, Isaiah Bowman, and more recently Philip Mosley, Grayson L. Kirk, and Henry M. Winston, or Riston. The Wall Street contracts with these created originally from Morgan's influence in handling large academic endowments. You see, if you want to shape the world, you must make sure that what's been taught in the universities is your version of history, and you also teach them through the humanities why you must change the future by giving a particular slant on history. Very famous for creating very strong slants on history to influence the future. It says here, closely allied with the Morgan influence were a small group of Wall Street law firms whose chief figures were Elihu Root, John W. Davis, Paul D. Cravath, Russell Leffingwell, and the Dulles brothers. The Dulles brothers were in and out of the CIA their whole lives long. I'll be back with more after this break. You're listening to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Because you can handle the truth. I'm Alan Ward, We're cutting through the matrix, putting together some of the events that happened in the 20th century and showing you the reasons, or at least the, the big institutions behind them. This parallel government, as it's also called, I, I call it the true government because they advise everyone else as to what to do. And they're one of the premier think tanks that advise on all kinds of foreign policy, etc., and reading from Tragedy and Hope from the guy who was the historian for this particular group and got a hold of all their records and who believed in their cause too, by the way. And reading from his book, Tragedy and Hope, on page 953, he says, on this basis, which was originally financial and goes back to George Peabody, very important person again, that grew up in the 20th century, a power structure between London and New York, which penetrated deeply into university life, the press, in the practice of foreign policy. This is what they call in Britain and MI6, uh, and Margaret Thatcher use it all the time, uh, our special relationship with the United States. Our special relationship is never elaborated upon, but that's what she was talking about. In England, the centre was a round table group. In the US, it was J.P. Morgan and Company, 
Airport's local branches in Boston, Philadelphia and Cleveland. Some rather incidental examples of the operations of this structure are very revealing just because they're incidental. For example, it's set up in Princeton. A reasonable copy of the Round Table Group's chief Oxford headquarters, which was All Souls College. They made a duplicate in the United States. That's where the real, the guys who are in on the real big picture are allowed into All Souls College. The copy they set up in the U.S. is called the Institute for Advanced Study. If you look into the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's still there today because it spearheads most of the social studies that are taught across the planet. Einstein stayed there until his death at that as a faculty member there in 55. And you'll find, too, that Robert Oppenheimer of the Manhattan Project also was there. Many big people were there because that really set the tone for all the other universities. They were the ones who also came up for all the programming, the language for the computer systems we're using now. The way ahead of everything. But they're right into social studies, what I would call social engineering. That's the real goal. Have a look into their site. It's up on the web. So that's a copy of All Souls College. This copy called the Institute for Advanced Study and best known perhaps as the refuge of Einstein, Oppenheimer, John von Neumann and George F. Kennan was organized by Abraham Flexner of the Carnegie Foundation and Rockefeller's General Education Board after, he'd been, after, after he had experienced the delights of All Souls while serving at Rhodes Memorial Lecturer at Oxford. The plans were largely drawn up by Tom Jones, one of the round table's most active intriguers and foundation administrators. Learn what the word intrigue means. It's very important in the way they operate the world. The American branch of this English establishment exerted much of its influence through five American newspapers, the New York Times, New York Herald Tribune, Christian Science Monitor, Washington Post, and the lamented Boston Evening Transcript. In fact, the editor of the Christian Science Monitor was the chief American correspondent anonymously of the Round Table Journal and Lord Lothian, the original editor of the Round Table, and later Secretary of the Rhodes Trust, an ambassador to Washington, was a frequent writer in the Monitor. It might be mentioned that the existence of this Wall Street Anglo-American axis is quite obvious once it is pointed out. It is reflected in the fact that such Wall Street luminaries such as John W. Davis, Lewis Douglas, John Whitney, and Douglas Dillon were appointed to be American ambassadors in London. And then goes on to talk about the different countries and how they set it up for different blocks, including the Far East, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada as well. And how they basically run the country, the countries ever since. Since the financing came from the same international banking groups for, for Canada, Australia, Canada. And it says in England, Chatham House was financed for both networks by the contributions of Sir Abe Bailey, the Astor family, and additional funds largely acquired by the persuasive powers of Linus Lionel Curtis. The financial difficulties of the IPR, the Institute for Pacific Relations, that's what they called the Australian branch at one point. It was a front group, as they say, a dummy group for the Royal Institute of International Affairs. It says, in the British Dominions in the Depression of 29-35 resulted in a very revealing effort to save money when the local Institute of International Affairs absorbed the local Pacific Council both of which were, in a way, expensive and needless, needless fronts for their local roundtable groups. The chief aims of this elaborate semi-secret organization were largely commendable. Now, remember, quickly was all for the, this whole movement, to coordinate the international activities and outlooks of all the English-speaking world into one, which would largely, if it is true, be that of the London group, to work to maintain the peace and the drone version of peace. Remember, they started wars. Uh, like the Boer War, to help backward colonial and underdeveloped areas to advance towards stable stability, law and order, and prosperity along lines somewhat similar to those taught at Oxford at the University of London, especially the School of Econo Economics. And everyone who studied the London School of Economics gets an idea of the re revolutionary aspects that comes out of it, and the schools of African and Oriental Studies. These organizations and their financial backers were in no sense reactionary or fascistic persons 
as communist propaganda would like to depict them. Quite the contrary, they were, they were gracious. This is Quigley's view of it because he belongs to that type of elite himself. They were gracious and cultured gentlemen of somewhat limited social experience who were much concerned with the freedom and expression of minorities and the rule of law for all. These are all big bankers and their, and their children here. They're really concerned about freedom of expression and justice for everybody. It says, who constantly thought in terms of Anglo-American solidarity, of political partition and federation, and who were convinced that they could, listen to this, convinced they could gracefully civilize the Boers of South Africa, the Irish, the Arabs. Do you wonder what's happening in the Middle East right now? You have to go into history. And the Hindus, and who are largely responsible for the partitions of Ireland. This is on page 954. Partitions of Ireland, Palestine, yeah, and India, as well as the federations of South Africa, Central Africa, and the West Indies. If you want to find out who set Israel up in the first place, go into your history books. Read the memoirs of Sir Ronald Storrs, S-T-O-R-R-S. He was a high commissioner for Palestine before World War II. Read his book called Orientations as well because they were setting up an advanced post for the future. They knew that the last places to come down would be the Arabian countries. They need an advanced post. And he gives you the whole story in his own books. Sir Ronald Storrs, Memoirs, and his other book called Orientations. And you have to understand what's happening too in the Middle East was decided long before they set up Israel. People have probably seen the movie rather than read the book of Lawrence, often called Lawrence of Arabia, who didn't get on too well with his bosses because they'd already decided that the Arab countries would, could never be civilized as such. And remember I talked about the lists of peoples they had set up for really elimination, those who could not be absorbed into the new civilization. That's why the, 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 IRR, the Royal Institute for International Affairs was involved with Ireland as well. H.G. Wells, another member, had a whole list of peoples who would have to be eliminated because they wouldn't fit in. And long before him, he had top economists like John Stuart Mill and his son, the same name, giving up the same list of people. They knew long ago who would come through into this brave new world. And they also knew who would give them trouble. But if you don't know what happened in the past, you won't understand a thing that's happening today. And remember, this group has hidden behind every other group, and the other groups have fronted for them often, unwittingly. And they take the heat. They take the heat. So they set up divisions across the Middle East, very good ones, and that's why they're all warring since. And then it funded each side to go at it. That's what that's what you saw with Iran and Iraq for years and years and years. They drew the lines on the maps, gave them to the governments that implemented them, and then they help to make sure they can go at it till we're all sick of watching war. It says here it must be recognized that the power that these energetic left-wingers, because they funded all them too, exercised was never their own power or communist power, but was ultimately the power of the international financial coterie, the bankers. The bankers ruled and run and financed all what you thought was a communist. And once the anger and suspicions of the American people were aroused as they were by 1950, it was a fairly, simp a fairly simple matter to get rid of the red sympathizers. So they took the fall. They were the scapegoats for all. But it, but it, it still hid the Council on Foreign Relations who were behind it. Before this could be done, however, a congressional committee, that's the Rees Commission, following backward to their source, finding out where all the funding was going, was getting, how the, where was this funding coming from that was funding all of these communist fronts? A congressional committee following backward to their source, the threads which led 
from admitted communists like Whitaker Chambers through Alger Hiss, who, who draft, helped draft up the UN Charter, by the way, along with a Canadian from Toronto, and the Carnegie Endowment to Thomas Lamont and the Morgan Bank fell into the whole com- complicated network of the interlocking, the interlocking tax-exempt foundations. Now, that's very important, how we can skip over something. The interlocking tax-exempt foundations. It's all one massive network. The 83rd Congress in July 1953 set up a special committee to investigate tax-exempt foundations with Representative B. Carroll Reese of Tennessee as chairman. It soon became clear that the people of immense wealth would be unhappy if the investigation went too far. Well, you'd bet they would be. And that the most respected newspapers in the country closely allied with these men of wealth would not get excited enough about any revelations to make the publicity worthwhile in terms of votes or campaign contributions. An interesting report showing the left-wing associations of the interlocking nexus of tax-exempt foundations was issued in 1954, uh, and, and rather quietly. Four years later, the Rees Committee's General Counsel, Rennie A. Wormser, wrote a short but not shocking book on the subject called Foundations, Their Power and Influence. It had been toned right down and still kept the, the public in the dark as to who really funded all these left-wing movements that seem to be communist. One of the most interesting members of this Anglo-American power structure was Jerome, Jerome or Jerome D. Green. I think it was through his whole history. Again, another Kissinger type who's all over the globe. Assistant to John D. Rockefeller in philanthropic work for two years, then trustee to the Rockefeller Institute, then to the Rockefeller Foundation, and then to Rockefeller General Education Board until 1939. For 15 years, he was with the Boston investment banking firm of Lee Higginson and Company, most of the period as his chief officer as well as, as with his London branch. See how, how the top characters are all massive international bankers here who want to bring us all world peace, who fund left-wing and right-wing organizations. As, a, as an investment banker, we know what they've done recently, Green is chiefly remembered for his sales of millions of dollars of the fraudulent securities of the Swedish match king, Ivor Kruger. That Green offered these to American investing public in good faith is evident from the fact that he's covering up for the fact that this guy sold a lot of dud stock to the American people. Which always takes me back to something that Albert Pike talked about in Morals and Dogma when he said that we shall have to basically climb to the top by every means possible, by their wit and courage, and by even using the stock market, he said, to to gain gain incredible wealth until we become the masters over the masters of the world. And, of course, he was talking about world revolutionary movements. And when you tie this in with tragedy and hope, and what these boys have been up to for over 100 years, you start to get a kind of connection somewhere, don't you? This is funding by David Davis in 1919, in spite of the fact that Davis was made a peer, he was knighted in 1932, had broken with the round table because of his subversion by the League of Nations and European Collective Security. Other people were looking into them too. People that had been set up by them were now looking into them. Jerome Green is a symbol of much more than the Wall Street influence and the IPR. He's also a symbol of the relationship between the financial circles of London and those of the eastern United States, which reflects one of the most powerful influences in the 20th century American and world history. The two ends of this English-speaking axis have sometimes been called, perhaps facetiously, the English and American establishments. There is, however, a considerable degree of truth behind the joke a truth which which reflects a very real power structure. It is this power structure which the radical right in in the United States has been attacking for years in the belief that they are attacking the communists. This is particularly true when these attacks are directed, as they so frequently are, at Harvard Socialism, as it's called, or at left-wing newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post, or at foundations and their dependent establishments such as the Institute of International Education. See, they run all of these associations. 
These misdirected attacks by the radical right did much to confuse the American people in the period from 48 to 55, it still does, and left consequences which were still significant a decade later. By the end of 53, most of these attacks had run, had run their course. American people, thoroughly bewildered at widespread charges of 20 years of treason and subversion, had rejected the Democrats and put in the White House, the Republican Party's traditional favorite, a war hero, Dwight D. Eisenhower. And it's interesting, too, as I say, how Dwight D. Eisenhower was taking advice from advisors from the very same group. And also they brought on board, already and had brought on board, all of the same characters that, that were into culture creation. They're taking on Bernays and all of those people too. Because after all, if you want to take over a world, you have to mold the minds of your victims so that they'll comply quite happily without knowing where they're going. The thinking that they do. It's very important you think you do. We'll be back with more after this break. I'm Alan Watt for Cutting to the Matrix, just taking up some of the past, which still exists in the present. In fact, more so than ever, it's much, much larger, and it's spread across pretty well every country on the planet. Uh, an organization that's worked with religious zeal, definitely religious zeal, to bring in a type of world system. But let's not forget that behind it all, it was started by people who were into Darwinism. They were into superior and inferior types of people. They've used anthropology down through the years, still do lead the, lead the, the fields of that, some of their top, their top uh, universities, which they run since they set the curriculums. And they have an ideal society to come out in the future. They're the ones who also came up with the the global warming idea too. Man needs an enemy for a global society. If there's no more countries to point to and say, look, we're better than they are, that's how it works. Then you have to find an enemy within. And of course, the enemy is man himself, according to the Club of Rome. One of the foundations that's just a part of this interlocking foundation network that Mr. Quigley talks about here. Our minds are entirely controlled and have been since we were born because, I say, they set up the educational systems. They decided what you'd be taught, what spins you'd have, which would, would make sure that for the rest of your life you'd always go back to that teaching to try to draw reasonable conclusions. Well, if it's a warped theory to begin with, your reasoning will always be warped. Remember, as I say, that Cecil Rhodes said they'd set up copied, they basically copied the Jesuit system. The Jesuits were famous for setting up front groups and having intrigue. Intrigue also meant having wars. So that the combatants would go at it together, never realizing there was another element behind it that would stay safe and out of sight and never take the blame for it. That's been their technique down through the years. I have many of their books printed by the CFR and the Royal for International Affairs and the minutes of their meetings. I scoured old bookstores, getting holes of some of them that obviously had been owned by previous members. And they had everyone in it, the tops of all the labor unions, all the top journalists across the planet, the editors attending world meetings discussing wars like World War II before it even happened, even mentioning the fact that Japan would come in and that would bring America into it. In 1938, they wrote that one. They were absolutely certain of a post-war world that they would set up. They, in fact, the war didn't even phase them, this coming war. They didn't even consider they might lose because they were on both sides of everything. Had even been involved with Adolf Hitler. Many of the big members and bankers 
had set up IG Farben that gave Adolf Hitler his war machine. Look at the book, Trials of IG Farben. The Trials and Punishment, I think it's called, of IG Farben. And look at the, the amount of lawyers sent over to the Nuremberg trials to try and cover the coattails of IG Farben and get them out of it, squeaky clean, at least as much as possible. Same CFR members too, and Rockefeller boys, etc. Thanks for listening. It's good night from Hamish and myself from Canada. <laughs>